so at Breadloaf in 2015, one of my fellow fellows uh, was this fantastic poet named Yona Harvey, who um, it was recently announced, like last month, will be writing the comic Storm for Marvel. And uh, she's amazing, and we had a great time, and she was, told us all these terrible things about her husband, who happened to be there also this, that same summer, and his name was Terrence Hayes. And uh, they met, I think, at 1998 at a Cave Canem, was that? Yeah, Cave Canem retreat. And um, in truth, I've actually loved Terrence's work uh, since I read his collection, Lighthead, in 2010, uh, the same year it won the National Book Award and was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the Hurston Wright Award. That summer in 2015, I was initially excited and then subsequently absolutely blown away by Terrence's craft talk, which was called DIY for Langston Hughes. And I was like, what does that mean? And uh, it was just incredible. And uh, I listened to it twice on the, in the airport and on the flight home from, because they had a podcast of it, and I listened to it uh, as I was leaving the place twice. Um, it was that great. Um, Hayes is a 2014 MacArthur Fellow, uh, his most recent uh, poetry collection, How to Be Drawn, over there, um, which I picked up that summer, is a stunning book and wildly inventive. Uh, his other honors include a Guggenheim and NEA Fellowship. His first book, Muscular Music won both a Whiting Award and a Kate Tufts Discovery Award. His second book, Hip Logic, was a National Poetry Series selection and a finalist for both the, for the Los, Los Angeles Times Book Award and the James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets. Wind in a Box, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award finalist, was named one of the best books of 2006 by Publishers Weekly. The accolades, I'm just getting started, I'm just getting warmed up here. Um, and we're just talking about his book so far. Um, he's edited Best American Poets and has been uh, in the anthology nine times, that I know of. Um, Hayes was born in Columbia, South Carolina in 1971 and educated at Corker College, where he studied painting and English and was an academic All-American on the men's basketball team. After receiving his MFA from the University of Pittsburgh in 1997, he taught in southern Japan, Columbus, Ohio, and New Orleans. Hayes returned to Pittsburgh in 2001, and now he's a professor at the University of Pittsburgh and spending a little time in New York at NYU right now. After Terrence's talk, he's gonna come up here and talk for about 35, 45 minutes. There's gonna be a brief intermission. Please use the restroom buy books, buy drinks, um, relax, it's like five, 10 minutes, and then he will return to the stage and there will be a Q&A with, uh, with the one and only Rich Smith from, Seattle, um, from Seattle's own The Stranger. Rich is the books and theater critic for The Stranger. He's also a damn fine poet himself and writes wonderfully about poetry. Uh, he's the author of Great Poem of Desire and Other Poems and All Talk, both from Poor Claudia. His poems have appeared in Tin House, Okie Panky, and Verse Daily. Rich was an actor and a playwright at the University of Missouri, but then started writing poetry and everything else took a back seat. He went on to Ohio University for his MA in creative writing and then the University of Washington here locally for his MFA. And it's my great pleasure now to welcome Terrence to the stage. So the great thing about the Q&A is that any questions you have, even about craft, can come then. Um, because all I'm going to do is keep time. That's all I really care about. So you'll see. I'm going to read for like 10 minutes, and then I'm going to talk to you about how this is related. Maybe it'll be clear. In the middle there, I'll talk a little bit about craft and uh, obsession. And then if I don't go over with that, then I'll maybe read for like five or 10 minutes more. So that should get us at about 30 minutes, 35 minutes. This, this is how I think about everything in the world. So. <laughs> And then we'll talk. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything. I didn't even want to say that much. I really wanted to just come up here and just start reading. I'm like, that would be bad. That'd be like, fuck everything. I'm just going to read. <laughs> American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. 
I lock you in an American sonnet that is part prison, part panic closet, a little room in a house set aflame. I lock you in a form that is part music box, part meat grinder, to separate the song of the bird from the bone. I lock your persona in a dream-inducing sleeper hold while your better selves watch from the bleachers. I make you both Jim and Crow here. As the crow, you undergo a beautiful catharsis when you are trapped one night in the gym. As the gym, the feel of crow shit dropping to your floors is indistinguishable from the stars falling from the pep rally posters on your walls. I make you a box of darkness with a bird in its heart, voltas of acoustics, instinct, and metaphor. It is not enough to love you. It is not enough to want you destroyed. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Probably ghosts are allergic to us. Our uproarious breathing and ruckus, our eruptions, our disregard for dust. Some worlds unwhirl in the corners of our homes after death. Our warriors, weirdos, anti-heroes, our sirs, sires, our sires, sidewinders and whiners, winos and wonders become dust. I know a few of the dead. I remember my sister's last hurrah. I remember the horror of her head on a pillow. For a long time, the numbers were balanced, the number alive equal to the number in graves. After a very long time, the bones become dust again. And the dust, after a long time, becomes dirt, and the dirt becomes soil, and the soil becomes grain again. This bitter earth is a song clogging the mouth before it's swallowed and spat out. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. When MLK was shot, his blood changed to change wherever it hit the floor. Like the others, Jackson and Abernathy gathered a few of the coins for themselves. Some were the size of buttons or thin as communion wafers, made of gold, bronze, all kinds of metal. A maid sold the copper penny she found for a pretty penny on the black market. It is in the display case beside the bullets Du Bois kept in the shotgun under his bed. Garvey rode a horse so tall he disappeared. X grew large as the roots of a tree crisscrossing the landscape. In the game of chicken, two drivers speed at each other, and, someone, and if someone does not swerve, both drivers may die in the crash. This country is mine as much as an orphan's house is his. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. The black poet would love to say his century began with Hughes or God forbid Wheatley, but actually it began with all the poetry weirdos, warriors, warriors, poetry winos and whiners, falling from ship bows, sunset bridges and windows. In a second, I'll tell you how little writing rescues. My hunch is that Sylvia Plath was not especially fun company. A drama queen, Thin-skinned and skittery, she thought her poems were ordinary. What do you call a vision? Uh, what do you call a visionary who does not acknowledge her vision? Orpheus was alone when he invented writing. His manic drawing became a kind of writing when he sent his beloved a sketch of an eye with an X struck through it. He meant, I am blind without you. She thought he meant, I never want to see you again. It is possible he meant that too. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Are you not the color of this country's current threat advisory and of pom-poms at a school whose mascot is the Clementine? Color of the quartered cantaloupe beside the tiers of easily bruised bananas cowering in towers of yellow skin. 
and of Caligula's copper-toned jabber jaw, jammed with grapes, shaped like the eyeballs of blind people. Light as a featherweight monarch, viceroy, goldfish, pomp and pumpkin pompadour. Are you not a flame of hollow hell lows and hell knows? A wild, tattered spirit versus what? Enemy to foe of those opposed to upholding the laws against what? I know your shade. You are the color of a sucker punch, the mix of blood and surprise blurring the eyes, a flare of confusion, a contusion before it swells and darkens. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. The earth of my nigger eyes are assassinated. The deep well of my nigger throat is assassinated. The tender bells of my nigger testicles are gone. You assassinate the sound of our bullshit and blissfulness. The bones managing the body's business are cloaked until you assassinate my nigger flesh. The skin is replaced by a cloak of fire. Sometimes it is rain or river water that cloaks the bones. Sometimes we lie on the roadside in bushels of knotted roots, flowers and thorns until our body is found. You assassinate the smell of my breath, which is like smoke, milk, twilight itself. You assassinate my tongue, which is like the head of a turtle wearing my skull for a shell. You assassinate my lovely legs and the muscular hook of my cock. Still, I speak for the dead. You will never assassinate my ghost. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Maybe I was too hard on Derek Walcott. In preschool, while I lay on a nylon cot in a church basement staring at God knows what, I was not asleep when the old deacon snuck downstairs to let the two sisters watching over us lay hands against his advances. His crown was haloed in gray, but eyebrows and eyelashes swirled black as calligraphy around his gaze. Cut it out, I'd hear the girl with plump plum lips say. He wore a silver bracelet. He spoke with a radiant sway. Everywhere, he was known to pray a prayer so blood-filled and persuasive, some listeners began to fever, kneel, break, beg, levitate. Seven of the uh, American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Seven of the ten things I love in the face of James Baldwin concern the spiritual elasticity of his expressions. The sachet between left and right eyebrow, for example. The crease between his eyes like a tuning fork or furrow, like a riverbed branching into tributaries, like lines of rapturous sentences searching for a period. The dimple in his chin narrows and expands like a pupil. Most of all, I love all of his eyes and those wrinkles, the feel and color of wet driftwood in the mud around those eyes. Mud is made of simple rain and earth, the same baptismal spills and hills of dirt James Baldwin is made of. And then this is the last one before we talk. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. I'm not sure how to hold my face when I dance. In an expression of determination or euphoria? And how should I look at my partner? In her eyes or at her body? Should I mirror the rhythm of her hips or should I take the lead? I hear Jimi Hendrix was also unsure in dance, despite being beautiful and especially attuned. Most black people know this about him. He understood the rhythm of a Delta farmer on guitar in a juke joint circa 1933, as well as the rhythm of your standard Negro bohemian on guitar somewhere uptown amid daydreams of jumping through windows, ballads of footwork, monk orchestras, miles with strings, whatever. I'm just saying, I don't know how to hold myself when I dance, do you? 
Okay, so craft of obsession. So what I really think about craft is that, you know, it's like talking about basketball instead of playing it or talking about dancing, like you gotta put your foot here. So the best thing to do is sort of show you that it's a practice, so that's why I started out with just that. And I think you'll make some of the connections and as I said, we'll do that with our Q&A. So instead though, in this little bit of time here, what I really wanna talk about is just uh, the permission that strategies in uh, Linda Hall gives me to even get to what I'm doing, which is like writing <laughs> a million poems with the same title. And she's just a poet, I think, who her, her loves were kind of clear very early on. She likes jazz, she likes noir atmosphere, you know, uh, black and white. She likes Montgomery Cliff, she likes Humphrey Go Bogart. Um, she likes a little bit of darkness, she likes a little bit of rain. So this is clear from her earliest poems. And I'm not gonna take you through the poems as I did earlier today, like you should have come to the workshop if you really wanted to get all of that. I just have one poem that I'm gonna read you to some of the things that she's doing. So what I would say is that, you know, like once you've written a poem about your grandmama or your favorite car, can you do it again? And so that question for me has been like, yeah, I think there's a way to do it. For her, she kind of formally challenged herself over her, the short span of her life. So let me do her life real quick. You know, she, I don't know what she did before she write, wrote poetry. I know that she, one of her, uh, when she was in therapy with her husband, their therapist was the brother of Don King, so for whatever that's worth. <laughs> but uh, she had a, maybe a fairly circuitous route. I never met her. Um, but not too long after she died, one of her teachers, Yusuf Komenyaka, was like, oh, you should check her out. I think, you know, you'd be interested in her. And so she's been a kind of like, a force for me, primarily because of her sentences. Uh, she likes a lush, long, slightly, you know, uh, slinging, swinging, slanted syntax. So that interests me because you could do a lot inside of that. And that is probably the fullest extension of her, her work. So I'll just say one craft thing so you can't say I didn't say anything else. If you have other craft questions, you're going to have to ask me. One of the things she does is she just likes lists. So in the poems that I just read, when I do a thing like, we don't have to talk about what the, uh, maybe you know what the Walcott poem was about, but um, at the end of it, it's like, you know, when he prayed, he could make people levitate, sway, uh, kneel, beg, et cetera, et cetera. There's like five adjectives lined up with no and in it. So she does that all the time. And there's a, there's a technical term for it. This is what I'm trying to sound like. I'm really smart and giving you some craft information. It's uh, a syndeton, which is like, you know, uh, a list that doesn't have the joining conjunctions and the, Polysyndeton is when you say the house and the car and the rat and the dog and the boy and the, you know, but if you just say the house, the car, the rat, the dog, the boy, stop. Or they used to fever, kneel, beg, sway, levitate. There's a way that it's sort of kind of open-ended. And so for me, that leaves the room for uh, improvisation seemingly and just sort of continuity, like it's just not gonna stop. So to me, that little device, that little rhetorical device, is perfect for the ways that obsession works in poems, the kind of catalog, the inventory. Of course, what we have, um, just under the pressure of invention in, in America, maybe in humanity, is to always be new, like the pressure of the new. So that when I thought, after about maybe the fourth one, I've probably written maybe about 80 of them now, they all had the same title, but after maybe the fourth one, I was like, okay, I gotta find out some reason to make this sound smart so people won't think I'm crazy, which you maybe still do. So. For me, the craft of obsession is just really figuring out how to obey and acknowledge whatever your obsessions are. For her, it's music. Um, and then figure out what kinds of boxes you can put them in. Hence, for me, the fact that I'm working in the sonnet form across these. And all I'm doing in the sonnet form, I'm dispensing with like counting syllables and I have a pentameter and in rhyme. But mostly it's the volta, if you know how the, uh, the form works. It's just the sort of turn that happens down inside the form that is most compelling to me because what it means is no matter what I'm thinking, like the poem with all the orange in it, that's like a Trump poem. That's who I'm, there's others, but I was like, I don't know how y'all feel I shouldn't be. Maybe I'll read some more in the second half after I finish talking, you know, because they get a little far out and I have offended people with them, which is great. So uh, trying to figure out like, well, how am I gonna do this? So it's sort of like how many turns can you make down inside of the box? For her, it was a formal question. So I'm gonna read this one poem here and we'll see if my buzzer goes off. So in her first book, did I tell her full story? She's uh, 
she publishes her first book and wins like the Juniper Prize in 86, it's called Ghost Money. And in that book, she has a poem called Hollywood Jazz. And it sounds like what it is, like what is Hollywood Jazz? That's noir jazz, that's like Mike Hammer, Mickey Spillane, uh, Humphrey Bogart, it's black and white. And the poem sort of works out a lot of those kinds of details. And then it just has other stuff that starts, sort of shows up in her poems. So like the beginning of it is, who says it's cool says wrong, for it rises from the city's sweltering geometry of rooms, fire escapes and flares, from the heels of corner boys and Occidental. So those boys that show up again in other poems, the girl who is here, uh, when the woman finds herself alone, perfectly alone in a hotel room before a man whose face is so shadowed as to be invisible, um, I know her riffs are minor. So looking at the screen and thinking about that genre, we're really romanticizing it. So that the title really does say what it is, Hollywood jazz, it's not quite anecdotal, like she's not really interested in telling stories, but she is interested in kind of creating an atmosphere. So she writes that, there's other poems, typical first book poems, you know, her parents growing up in New Jersey, et cetera. And then a few years later, I wanna say 91, she writes what I think is really her best book, which is Star Ledger. So the lines are a little bit fuller. And in this book, she's got a poem called Lost Fugue for Chet. It was actually in one of the best American poetries uh, at some point. Longer lines, it's still jazz. It's in fact still a, a wind instrument. You know, it's a trumpet. The other poem features a clarinet and the saxophone, the, the Hollywood jazz poem, which is of course key to like that, that noir feel. It has to be some kind of like clarinet or saxophone to fully embody it. Um, this one too is somewhat anecdotal. It's about Chet Baker, uh, really good looking young West Coast uh, jazz musician who, who actually liked heroin quite a bit. So it ain't even, I, it's different if like you like it. So he was an addict, but he was an unrepented addict is what I would say. And so what she's interested in in that is like his bizarre death in Amsterdam in the 80s. Um, he fell from like a window or something. And so in that poem too, she's still messing with these long sentences and she's doing the, the, the term that I just mentioned, the sort of ascendaton. Uh, so look here, the boys again. Ghostly, the horns, improvisations, pearl and murmur, the narrow straces, the district rife with purse snatchers, women alluring, desolate, poised in blue windows, Michelangelo boys, hair spilling, fluent running cords, mare's tails in the green and violent. So again, no and in there, it's just a sort of list, a kind of catalog of things. There are the boys again, the geometry, the small time grace. Um, and again, a little more developed, a little more complicated than what she does in um, her first book in Hollywood Jazz, but the same principle, which is she's enamored with ghost, she's enamored with a certain kind of sound, and a certain kind of musician, a certain kind of tragic, romantic figure. So you would just say, like, in a workshop, or maybe in graduate school, or uh, maybe if you just found a couple of books in the bookstore, you'd be like, kind of one-trick pony, like, does she do anything else? But looking a little bit closer, you can see that each time what she's really doing is seeing how much more complicated her sentence can be. And the rest of it, she just embraces. So hence, this is the, the practice of craft. Like for me, craft is just like, it's practice. So that means, can I write through an obsession? If I have this obsession in our current environment, our current climate, where I am thinking, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know how young everybody is. Yeah, I, I won't use profanity, but like, I'm yeah, okay, somebody trying to kill me, you know? So that means I need to really kind of work that through. But there are rules that says every poem has to have a different title and should be set up differently and sort of work through all the mysteries that, for me, aren't quite what I'm interested in, in the, the notion of the, the Volta. And in fact, what I'll say is what I'm really interested in, why they would be sonnets, is because of the opportunity to keep kind of turning back to that, even if I'm saying, it's my assassin. It's like trying to be a love poem for my assassin. And also, you know, love poems for things that kill me in joy, you know, Baldwin. Um, but the point is, working out a strategy, which may or may not work, I sort of, that's the thing about practice, it doesn't have to necessarily work, you know, it's just practice. So for me, the que it's a question. Craft is a pursuit, craft is a practice, uh, more than like a formula, more than a thing that you can write out, which always bothers me about the notion of the craft talk, as if I figured it out because I'm up here talking to you about it. And I would say, well, kind of the joy is the pursuit. So let me read her poem so I can say I read one for you. And then I'll, you know, I'll read maybe like five more or something. They're short, as you can see, my poems, and then we'll talk. And you can ask me all the stuff that I forgot to say up here. Uh, so this is Ornithology. It's in her last book. 
It's about Charlie Parker. So again, you can see she's got Chet Baker, she's got somebody playing sax in a movie, and in her last book before she passed away uh, at 40, like in 94, this book came out a year after she died, she's got this poem. So what I'm gonna tell you to look for in it, okay, it's those weird lists that happens, the long spiraling sentences that happen, um, and also this sort of combination of song, here's my crap stuff for you, that's what I'm doing for you, a, bit, a capacity to combine like the impulse towards singing and the impulse towards um, telling a story. So buried down inside the poem is a story of just her and this dude, you know, uh, this drag queen going to find Charlie Parker's grave. But I'd say that to you because otherwise all you hear are colors and birds and stuff sort of fluttering by you. But I think that that's pretty cool and that is one of the effects you know, over the whole course of what I'm currently working on. I am thinking about, just again, just to get you to turn your head a little bit, you don't have to nod or shake, just be like, what, what happened? So, okay, so uh, ornithology. Gone to seed, Alanthus, the poverty tree, take a phrase, then fracture it. The pods, gaudy, nectarine shades, ripening to parrots, taking flight, all crest and tail feathers, a musical idea. Macaws, scarlet and violet, tangerine as song, the hue of sunset where my street becomes water. And down shore, this phantom skyline's mere hazy silhouette. The alto's liquid geometry weaves a way of thinking, a way of breaking synchronistic through time. So the girl on the corner has the bones of my face, the old photos beneath the Kansas City hat, black fedora, lifting hair off my neck, cooling the sweat of a long night tidal pool from bar to bar the night we went to find Bird's grave. Eric's chartreuse perfume that poured on dress I lived days and nights inside, made love and slept in, a mesh and slur of zipper down the back. Women smoked the boulevards with gardenias after hours, asphalt shower, slick, ozone charging air with 16th notes, that endless convertible ride to find the grave, whose sleep and melody wept neglect, enough to torch us for a while, through snare sweep of broom on pavement, the rumpled musk of lover's sheets, charred cornices topping crosstown gutted buildings, torches us still, cat screech, matte blue steel of pistol stroked against the victim's cheek, where fleet shoes jazz this dark and peeling block. Vine Street, Olive, we had the music, but not the pyrotechnics. Rhinestone straps lashing my shoes, heels sinking through earth, and Eric in casual drag, mocha cheekbones rouged that flawless plummy mouth. A style for moving, heel and tap, lighter flick, lion moan of buses pulling away through the static, brilliant fizz of taffeta on nylon thighs. Light mist, etheris, rinsed our faces, and what happens when you touch a finger to the cold stone that jazz and death played down to? Phrases, take it all and break forever. A man with gleaming sacks, an open sill in summertime, and the fire escapes iron zigzag, tumbles crazy notes to a girl cooling her knees wearing one of those dresses no one wears anymore. Darts and spaghetti straps, glitzy fabrics foaming and iron bedstead. The horns alarm, then fluid brass chromatics, extravagant Alanthus, the courtyard's poverty tree, is spike and wing, slate blue, morning dove, sudden cardinal flame. If you don't live it, it won't come out your horn. So you know, look her up. Um, Lots of good stuff here. So yeah, just uh, a couple more before we go. American Sonnet for My Past and Future Assassin. I'll just read like five of them. Otherwise, home is the mess laid bare, the less made air, the addressless dare less clear, the wax in my left ear makes half of what's said unsaid. On the air, the mute news hounds ponder the tweets of a bullhorn a rat in the cabinet beside the liquor. Anger is a form of heartbreak. Yes, it is. If you can give the world half of what Nina Simone gave it, you will have lived an exceptional life. All you have to say is, tomorrow you'll try to be better. Like a mother, lovingly calling her son a son of a bitch. 
My lover never believed I held a gun in my mouth. So I talked to myself like a witness. I would mutter whatever, whatever, forever, otherwise. Drive like 15 miles down the perpetual interstate, the barbed spears installed around the mansions of money managers have been painted white twice a year for more than two centuries, and they will look like signposts at the speed you pass them. Join the bottleneck at the mouth of the tunnel running beneath the river. You may recall a few years ago, a bomb was set off there. Caution tape, a rise in cargo takes, a till of bodies bobbed at the piers. How much have black people been paid for naming Emmett Till in poems? How much is owed? Never mind, never fear. The tunnel under that uproarious river around our lives has been repaired. When you exit, take the second right towards the oldest part of town. Ride until you find me bearing a sign on one of the corners there. American signing for my past and future assassin. A brother versed in ideological and material swagger seeks dime ass, trill bitch, starved enough to hang, do ragged and smoke, she can smell, and therefore inhale, and therefore feel. Must ride shotgun, pouring a fountain of bass upon the landscape. Must be fat assed, fearless and God fearing, an ancestral insurgent, clean as new money, a cryptographer, a storyteller, a glossy sleeve. There will be woo to jewelry you're hearing. There will be stacks of folded longing. Amid twilight verbiage and parking lots smelling of live wire, liquor, and fire, accompany a brother. Shout outs to vixens and bitches out there twerking for fucks in Bluff Estates, Washington Park, Starlight, Shop Road, Joe Frazier, Harlem Street. This is daddy's boy. Who wanted? And was that, was that four? Maybe there's just one more here. Um, from now, oh, American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. Oh yeah, okay, this one and then this last one here. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. From now on, I will do my laundry early Sunday mornings when all the young tenants are hungover or worn out, all the old people in church and all the pets and playgrounds parked, all the pets and parents parked at playgrounds with their children inside the play at your own risk sign on the fence. I tried to tell the woman who sends me poems, it's departure that makes company hard to master. I tried to tell her I'm a muser, a miser of time. I love poetry more than money or pussy. From now on, I will eat brunch alone. I believe Eurydice is actually the poet, not Orpheus. Her muse has his back to her with his ear bent to his own heart, as if what you learn making love to yourself matters more than what you learn making love to someone else. Uh, this is the last one. American Sonnet for my past and future assassin. So thanks, y'all. Um, I'll say this in the Q&A, but this is one of my favorite cities. I think I like it more than Chicago. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, but it's good to be back. I always like coming to Seattle. All right, so last one. American sign up for my past and future assassin. Inside me is a black-eyed animal bracing in a small stall, as if a bird could grow without breaking its shell, as if the clatter of a thousand blackbirds whipping in a storm could be held in a shell. Inside me is a huge, black bull, bald small enough to fit inside the bead of a nipple ring. I mean to leave a record of my raptures. I was raised by a beautiful man. I loved his grasp of time. My mother shaped my grasp of space. Would you rather spend the rest of eternity with your wild wings bewildering a cage or with your four good feet stuck in a plot of dirt. All right, y'all, look forward to talking. <laughs>
So Terrence, great yeah, poetry yeah, reading. Yeah. We had a great conversation backstage, so I don't know if we can replicate that. Yeah. You think we can? I think we so, can. All right. I think we can try. Although there were more strawberries and Milano cookies back there. Yeah, there were. We're supposed to bring those out. But <laughs> the lighting's better up here. Okay, what you got for me? I have a question. All right. First question. Uh -huh. You're writing sonnets. You're writing 80 sonnets. Everyone goes through this period uh -huh. uh, in their life as a poet. Shakespeare sure, yeah. went, started writing sonnets uh -huh, whenever uh -huh. the, uh, the, the plays closed down because sure. of the plague. Right, right, right. Gerald Stern, mm -hmm. sonnets. They were called American Sonnets. He wrote a series called American Sonnets. They weren't all 14 lines, though. But yeah, Jerry yeah. Stern. And so what brings you to the sonnet? And, 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 and did you become obsessed with a particular kind of sonnet well, they're in every book, in fact. I mean, so I've always been interested. And if I go in certain rooms, people will think I'm a formalist, you know, which I would say sometimes. That's pretty, pretty much my answer to everything, like uh -huh. well, sometimes. So I have always been interested uh, in the sonnet, partly because I think it's sort of just a gateway into poems. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that often puts people off because you're like, scanning it? What's that? You know, so I always just had issues with that. But a poem of mine that sort of still gets around, uh -huh. uh, which I never would have guessed, is like in... Um, Hip logic, and it's just called sonnet, and it's one line, and it's um, we slice the watermelon into smiles, or something like that. We slice the watermelon, and it's just you repeat over and right, over and 14 over. Fourteen times, lines and so I'm like, well, it rhymes. Smile definitely rhymes with smile. <laughs> but that's that was me even then in that book trying to like negotiate. I want to do this thing, but I sort of don't want to do it on other people's terms. Yeah, like, I like a box. You know what I mean? Like I want to get down in it, but I don't want you to put the lid on it. I want to be able to like. <laughs> So that's how I think of the sonnet, like just a sort of a great place to play. Uh -huh. uh, and as I said, in these, I've just been more thinking about turns, which is, and I, I usually hold back, like they're really weird ones that I sort of am reluctant to try sometimes, you know, but it's, that's sort of what I'm going for. Which one are you weirdness. reluctant to I mean, I read, I read them, so, you know, <laughs> none of those that I read, I don't think. But uh, there's a few, you know. Yeah. As I, I, we were talking backstage, I, I am interested in like, because of the sonnet, being a traditional love form, but I always think, well, love can go in two directions. It can go like to the transcendent, but also the transgressive. So there's a few like transgressive sonnets, whatever that means, I won't say what it means, whatever. <laughs> but sometimes people get mad, like I, as I said, I've read some where people were like, you know, that's inappropriate. Yeah. So, which makes me excited. That makes me, uh, then I don't read them here, but I, that does make me excited. Well, a lot, some of the poems seem to directed at Trump or something. Yeah, I never so, name them, but yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and do you struggle trying to figure out how, because, you know, it's, it's kind of easy to hate Trump. And right, but that's why they're sonnets, though. That's the great thing about the sonnet form, that yeah. it is implicitly about love, but you're still trying to figure out, like, well, how is this going to work? Yeah. You know, so, and that's when I started them. I mean, I literally started just a few the week of the election, and then the birthday of Wanda Coleman, who was a friend and a firecracker. Yeah. She's, she passed away, but uh, her birthday was on the 13th, November, which is my lucky number. So I was like, oh, okay, I got, this means something. So what I thought it meant was that I should write American Sonnets because she had American Sonnets sprinkled through all of her, her books. Yeah. Um, so they show up. So, and I, I have actually, I have one called American Sonnet for Wanda C in uh, the last book, which I sent her and you know, to let her know, I thought, I was like, man, people should write American Sonnets. I never thought I would be doing it, but I was saying to her, this is so, so fun. And do you have like a sense of like where, what the, because like when I think of the American Sonnet, I think of just something that's about 14 lines long, sure. about the size of a box, mm -hmm. doesn't really have to rhyme or anything. Right. Do you feel a particular pressure that sounds to good respond to, me. to that? Okay. That sounds good to me. I mean, so the only thing I would that, add yeah. is uh, the Volta in it, like yeah. that they, it, it should be making some kind of turn, which is like, you know what the Volta is, it's just like a certain kind of logic. Yeah. If you woke up in, in the poem and you're saying, it's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful day, there should be some turn. Yeah. But I've gotten more eccentric with what those turns are. So like the one that's, it's got MLK in it and the money, this blood turning to money, and then suddenly it talks about the game of chicken, and at the yeah. end of it, like this country is mine as much as an orphan's house it is. Like that's a bunch of weird, that's three major turns yeah. in it. Or the one that's like Sylvia Plath, and then suddenly it turns to Orpheus writing or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I so, loved how you turned on the image. There was that one, uh, the one where you, 
you used the uh, N-word a lot. Sure, sure, right, and, right, uh, right. It was very visceral. You mean nice? Is the huh? word. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, you I assassinate my it. niceness. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So yeah, yeah. I mean. Uh, well, but then it turns at the uh -huh. end on the ghost. Sure, because sure. Because you, right. you use mm -hmm. all you like build up all of this right. like physical imagery, all right. of this visceral imagery, and then mm -hmm. you say. But then you can't kill. You'll never kill my ghost. And sure, immediately, sure. all that visceral imagery becomes a spiritual energy. Sure, or sure, a, sure. You know, good, or good. A vapor. Yeah, that's and that good to hear. That becomes stronger than the than right. the muscular thing. Yeah. Used to so, me. Thanks. So, so you're yeah. turning on an image. You're turning on logic as you did yes, in the MLK. Yeah. Okay. So I would say that I would just add that to it. Everything you said about it sounds right to me. And you know, it's still it's still shaping. Like we have Italian sonnets. We have. The Italian sonnet is like Petrarch. The English sonnet is a Shakespearean sonnet. Milton has some sonnets. I mean, there's. There's forms, but there isn't really one for us, but there should be. Mm -hmm. So, and as I said, I'm not the first person to kind of think of the notion of the American sonnet. And yeah. I would say uh, Wanda Coleman wrote quite a few of them, if other people just did it sort of episodically. But do you get bored? I mean, you said you wrote 80 of these things. Like, do you ever just be like, I don't want to write another one of these? Or are you obsessed with trying to write the single best American sonnet of all time? So, the big challenge is the same title. Yeah. So they all have the same time. You laughed whenever you read it. I know, I know, I know. Because I've heard from people saying, like, well, what was the poem with the orange in it? And so, <laughs> so that actually frees me up, that I don't have to deal with titles. It's just like, okay, they're all the same title, and sometimes it's explicit, and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. So that's a great help for me to dispense with that. The other thing, which goes to the obsession question, is that, like, if I'm working an image out, uh, see, this, this is a profound one. I'm going to say it to you. I don't have the poem with me, so don't ask me to read it. So like I was working out this thing about like uh, maybe the first creature was a woman. So this is gonna be hard to explain it. So then I was like, well, you know, her, I can't, I can't go through it. But anyway, okay. so yeah, I'm like, I'm that's following. no way to talk about it without reading it. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, if I have an image that I'm struggling with, rather than revise the poem, I'll just sort of rework the image into another poem until I get it right. Okay. So that means there are a bunch of poems that are sort of half right, but that's fine, that's why. I work them out, but but you, um, but you don't get bored with the form. You're not like I want to. No, write a no, because you can put anything in it. It's like, do you get bored with a shoebox? No, you know how many different kinds of shoes <laughs> you can put in a shoebox. You can put even more than shoes in a shoebox. You know what I mean? You can make it a birdhouse, mailbox. Is, so you, I mean, I, it could just be anything. You, so I don't get bored with it. You mean in terms of, of subject, but there's also boredom in terms of. Um, uh, like a, a craft element or something, and we talked a little bit of in, 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 well. in the poems, <laughs> in the poems that I've seen uh, of yours, and in comparison with Linda Hall's poems she sure. read tonight, there is a, a love of lists, expansiveness, lists, a love of uh, going back to history, sure, and absolutely, making, and, and making that connection to the yes. to the present to show how the historical. So what you're reminding me of is the last poem. I mean, I've written other non sonnets but the last thing I read and had worked on for a period was a poem about my Frederick Douglass t-shirt, and the poem was 1,200 words. So I never sent it out. It was a fine poem. You know, I liked it. So it was like long lines, too. But when I finished it, I was like, oh, I think I should probably try to get a little bit shorter. Like, I think I've reached the limits of a long poem. Uh -huh. So it was pretty long. And then, so I, I didn't know what it would be, but I had thought I need an exercise to stop going on. Okay. And so the sonnet was that. So I do cut a lot of stuff out, but again, you know, I'll just put it somewhere else. It's just like, again, too much of stuff in the box, it's spilling over, so I'll just put it to the side and use it somewhere else later, if that makes any sense. So no, it's perfect for that, but it is uh, a way, I'm still writing a long poem, actually, if you want to know, I mean, that's yeah, all it yeah, is, yeah. but I, I just thought I was, that was too much uh -huh. to be reading really long poems like that. I didn't have time to read anything else once I read a couple of long poems, which wasn't good for me. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, it's just a response to, again, obsession. I'm just like trying a different shape, but maintaining the same kind of interest, I guess, is what I would say. But about your, about What's repeat, up? like are there, are there moves that you make in, in whenever I was writing a lot more poetry, uh, I would see myself making the same move all of the time. And right. I would fall back on this move, and I would be like, that's my move, and I love sure. it, and I'm obsessed yeah, yeah, with the yeah. move. It's like not even a subject matter. Right. It's just like, I am going to make this little pun that no one has caught yet for the rest of my life, or I am going to, like in your work, there's a lot of um, uh, consonants. Sure. Uh, and um, do you ever like catch yourself and say like, I can't do that move again? I, or well, that's do, or the thing about obsession. The thing about Linda Hall, and this is such a good question, is that 
I just, I was saying this to the group today, I hate to make it sound like sort of therapeutic, but I feel like so, many, so much of like writer's block is about shame. Yeah. And about the pressure of, invent of inventiveness, but I don't work like that. I mean, it's why I say practice. Yeah. Like, think about sports practice. Like, I mean, maybe somebody's in the gym, but you can sort of screw up. You're still working hard, but if you, you know, lose, nobody's really keeping score. So that's sort of my attitude, which is to say, I work on like fundamental stuff. I challenge myself as a daily habit. I don't think about books. I really don't even think about poetry, really. I mean, I just think about poems. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't even think I like poetry or poets, but I like poems. Yeah. You know what I mean? So No, I'm with you. I get so mad when people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I'm saying like, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I try not to indulge in anything that's going to make me uh, slow down. I'm so pleased to hear that. Even if I'm rolling, if I'm not like even walking down, I'm just falling. That's better <laughs> than like stopping and saying, now, which way should I fall? You know, that kind of question. So I just, I just worked Damn. through it. And she, to go back to her, is one of the few writers, I think this is true for Berryman too, yeah. who you just look at him and it's like, well, it's just obsessiveness. Yeah. But, and it doesn't always work. But again, that's sort of not the point. The point is not, can you win the game? It's just like, are you in shape? Have you challenged yourself? Have you failed a little bit? Did you learn something new? So that's enough for me. So when I say like the transgressive, or when I think I can't even describe an image that's so wild to me, which is really just about the clip becoming a penis, but that's all I say about it. So, you know, like, it's which so is, wild, which is but like Orpheus when I'm with yeah. myself, I'm like, okay, yeah, this is crazy. You'll never read this out loud, but that's enough. Like, you know, and then I read it and I start sweating and I feel like, okay, that's good. Cause I don't sweat when I read from the book. I only yeah. sweat when I'm reading stuff that's not in the book or that's stuff new. where I'm like, well, I've never done that before. Like, what do I think about that? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. And if you so. can piss off, there's a difference between embarrassing yourself because you're afraid to say a line right. because it's not good. You it ain't know. that. Yeah, it wouldn't be that. It's yeah. just sort of working out complicated ideas. And one of the things, which I said in the back, is just, I think I said it out, to just like, not just a transcendent, which is sort of, you know, romantic. And that's in the, in the ballpark of... Uh, of uh, the traditional Edna St. Vincent Millay or mm -hmm. even Shakespeare. But if you're saying, okay, in 2017, you're writing sonnets, what can you do? So I'm like, well, I could be a little nasty, I guess. I can write like <laughs> a little vulgarity, a little sort of transcendent vulgarity. I mean, it ain't really though, because I'm still trying to like write poems. But to think that on the way into a poem is a new thought for me. Yeah. And so that's enough, like yeah. to say, just to entertain that in the course of writing a poem occasionally. And also because I'm writing a series of, I can hide those. So I can write those and then they'll just be hidden out in the book with the same title. So okay, she'll be like, I know he had a poem with a clit in it, but yeah. I can't find it. So we have to you read know, the whole like, thing. I don't know, know what you're talking about. You know, you know. Um, yeah, know, exactly. And know. they can't like yeah, peg yeah. you as the clip poet because right. like you're like, no, that's yes. not the total expression. So, but I, of I'm that half series. serious though. I'm saying like yeah. because of that, I feel like I can totally be like balls out because sure. I'm like, well, you know, maybe nobody will see it. They'll just they won't even remember the poem when I read it to them. You know, it's that kind of thing. So there's, um, I heard a story. I'll, I'll share it with you. Uh, it was about a, <laughs> a painter. You're a painter mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And I, and I can't even remember. Her, I like heard it on the internet. And uh, the painter only does these huge um, um, uh, paintings of, of hardcore pornography stills mm -hmm. in the style of the old master. Interesting. Yeah. And that's all he does. That's right. all he's been doing. Okay. For 30 years wow. and yeah, someone yeah. asked him like do you ever get bored uh -huh. like only painting the same kind sure, of giant sure. painting and what was the answer to that and he said oh yeah uh -huh. yeah I get bored um, but I find that when I'm my most bored when I'm so like when the form has sort of uh -huh. like become me or something sure. and I like I'm like why do I keep doing this one thing over and over again right that painting sells the mo most of any other one in like the last decade interesting. Or something. yeah you lost me on the sell part but like <laughs> the freedom part I mean poets have yes. where you know like yeah. the poem where I you know but no but I understand that like that sort of sense of uh freedom yeah so I would associate that with the title like it just uh, yeah. it's a kind of easy door into the poems because I don't, I mean, you put a lot of work in the titles. It's like naming kids, you know, like you yeah. don't just sort of randomly name a kid, yeah. which is why I've always thought the George uh, Foreman kids, all being named George, was like <laughs> super radical, you know, like, okay, <laughs> why not? You know, why, I mean, it sounds like narcissism too, so, yeah. but uh, also radical. You also, know, so. I mean, if you have like a big tasks all the time, you can immediately summon an army. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. If you just yeah. say George, one word, George, George's, everyone. where are the Georges? Yeah. <laughs> Same kind of confusion, though, because it's like, it's sort of saying, you know, people are actually kind of hard to title. Yeah. And so just sort of the same title acknowledges the difficulty of 
putting a title on something. So, I'm, I mean, I've, you know, I've thought about these things from time. Once I was like, maybe I should call it once. That's all I said. Not past, but once. Once in future assassin. Oh, well, yeah. It's too late now. But uh, Are you obsessed? I was also, I'm a little bit confused about the, um, because who, your assassin, mm -hmm. can you be rightfully obsessed with an assassin? If like it's it, your president, <laughs> you can be. Yeah. But so. that's sort of like being obsessed with the, the bear who's about to eat you all the sure. time. It's like it's that not, would it's be like an obsession too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because sure. I guess so. So often we think of obsession as a kind of like fetish or a, an intrusion on on thought. Like you can't do anything else except for think of this one thing. And so except got for like paranoia and anxiety. I mean, paranoia is a kind of obsession too. You yeah. know. And it is true. It's just like I just have to have a place to put stuff and it did start that way it started as directly a response to like the whatever the environment was really right up until january yeah and then i was like oh this is getting old i should do something else and so i tried to force myself to think in different ways about the whole thing about not just about like the relationship to like power and the way the world has changed but also just to my thinking around what really is trying to kill me you know how much of joy how much what kinds of pleasures also trying to kill me so so I mean based on that it did open it up a little bit and uh, well, you don't seem to have yet been killed by joy so that's a good thing <laughs> yeah or almost killed by joy so yeah I mean again I mean, there's, so ma there's so many of them uh, of the poems but yeah they're you know uh, a heart attack while making love you know yeah. that kind of stuff that would kill me you know <laughs> Wouldn't be so, a bad sometimes life. I think that's what's gonna happen you know, like, <laughs> I was almost dead you know anyway well, and there, um, just there. Uh, well, <laughs> I know. I, no, I, I would want to go. I actually up. have a poem about that too, but uh, anyway, it's, about, I gotta write it about, about being you know, like split in half by an orgasm no, or something. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, yeah, we should stop there. Okay, <laughs> that's enough of my questions. Uh, yeah. So, does anybody else uh, uh, in the in the audience, if you have a question, um, we don't um, have any sort of runner to bring to amplify your voice. We'll so just like you. stand up and yell, and I'll repeat. Oh yeah, what's up? Thank my mama. Right, right. And so I'm wondering if you could be off the cuff a little bit and tell us um, how do you think we're doing as a team of poets in America right now? We was we, as in Seattle or? American poets. Right. Rising to the occasion of the current incarnations of hate and violence. That's such a tricky question because, I mean, my answer actually would be the same as rolling down the hill. Like, I wouldn't, so actually I'm going to give you an example, and this sort of shows up in the poems, because the poems are just, I'm folding everything, sort of real-time stuff into them. So, you know, at the Whitney, there was this big sort of dust up because this white woman, do y'all know this story? She did a painting, so far, y'all so far from New York, but she did this painting of like, uh, which is to say, yeah, it's not that big of a deal, but in New York it was a big deal. So anyway, um, she painted Emmett Till, the painting is called Open, Open Casket, and side note, like for me, I knew like the curators, and so I was there on the first day, and his brother was like in front of the painting. And so I'm walking with one of the curators. We, he, the dude didn't know this, because it was early in the morning, and he says, uh, I'm not letting anybody see this. His name is Parker. Y'all can't see this. I'm opposing this picture. And then I was like, why? And then he said, well, you know, this white woman can't make money off of Emmett Till's suffering. Hence, in my poem, it's what I thought, which is going to it. Like, I just thought, well, you know, I feel like we all made a little bit of money off of Emmett Till's. <laughs> So that's a deeper question. Like, and then I said to him, which is what I thought, and this is why they called me back. I was like, it just ain't a good painting. Like, actually, like, if it was a good painting, it looks like Francis Bacon to me. You know, that's what I said to the dude. He still wouldn't move. And then I thought that was it. But each day it got bigger and bigger. And so eventually, um, Whitney wanted to have a kind of intervention thing. And they were like, well, Terrence was there. He seemed like he's not going to burn the painting. We'll have him come back. Because that's what people were saying. So, and that was still just my point, which goes to the rolling down the hill. Like, I sort of feel like, my, even with her, everybody has a right to fail. So the most damning thing I could say about it was that it just wasn't a good painting. It was derivative. Not that a white woman can't paint the corpse of Emmett Till. Because my thought always goes to, like, like, you know, adjacency. So, 
But, you know, one time I had a kid, and this is what's in the poem, too, a brother in a class, and he wrote an Emmett Till poem. He thought he was the first person to ever write it. And I was like, man, you know how many Emmett Till poems there are? <laughs> but then I was like, but, you know, it's a good conversation because the question is, like, are there enough? And that's sort of what the how much is paid, how much is owed. And the dude said, but this is how my workshops are. I was like, you know, uh, I'm going to get you, like, five other Emmett Till poems that will be better than yours, and then you can decide if you're going to make it better or if you're going to stop, you know. And then... <laughs> Because I was like, maybe we got enough. And the dude said in the class, we don't, though. You can never say enough that Emmett Till was killed or that black people were killed really for no reason. There's never enough of that. And I was like, touche, good point. That's a good point. But I would still say in the space of the work, you don't want to have those kinds of big questions, like what is my responsibility to the world? I feel like if you know, you're a moral person, if you know the difference between right and wrong, you appreciate beauty, you have a problem with greed, I think nine times out of 10, you will be working in the direction uh, for the good. So having said all of that, that's what I would teach. For me, like I was like, I gotta do something about this goddamn Trump, you know, I gotta, gotta write something. So I have a poem, you know, I can remember this one too, like at the end of the poem about him, it's all the stuff he says, and I'm sure everybody's got a poem about him talking about grabbing pussy. But at the end of the poem, it's just like, you know, you don't understand your own blackness. You don't understand your own hustle. You don't understand that you actually have a black pussy and it's dying to be touched. You know, so for me, that's like, that's enough for me to be engaging him, even if he never finds it. But that's, that's all kind of stuff. Like, well, we all have pussies and it might all be black, actually, too. Everybody might have a black pussy. You know what I mean? So, like, to me, that's a philosophical question. It's political, but it's also like, well, why would that be that we would all have one? And what should we do about it if we do? But that's art. Art comes from that. So some people hear it, as I was saying backstage. Some people hear those lines. They're like, I'm not even going to touch your hand at the end of this reading. I'm so offended by the things you were saying. But I'm like, but these are real questions. Like, you know, your black pussy dies for touch. You know, so to me, that's art. That's poly it grows out of a kind of political concern. But the political concern is first just me trying to, like, you know, be alert and open and empathetic and challenging and also a good citizen too, like all of that, you know, and I just sort of, that's usually how I, I position those things. Like the first duty is like to be a good person, maybe, you know, vote every now and again. I think you should vote a lot and maybe go to some shit when people are saying we want the school board to do stuff. Like I would say that, like, you know, because for me, I have to get out of the house to do those things. Otherwise, I'll just stand and write poems. And I know that that's not purely an answer to the universe, but getting out allows me to feel good about staying home and saying, oh, I'm going to turn the TV off. I'm just going to work. Because I did go out and, like, you know, I did pay my taxes today. So <laughs> I think I deserve the right to stay in and work today. You know, it's like those kinds of things for me uh, to be engaged, I guess. So, And that was on my list, actually, of things to talk about, like mixing song and story. Um, and this thing about, like, the self meeting the social is also it's much subtler in in uh, Linda Hall, but she's interested in that too. So sometimes she just does look up. So the fact that they're in the graveyard, that she's there with a drag queen, that they're looking for uh, Bird's Cemetery and they're gonna clean it, to me that's all political. It's because it's a white woman, it's a black man in drag, they're trying to preserve this body that's been overlooked by history. So on the one hand, it's like an extended metaphor, but on the other hand, if that really happened, I would say that that's, a, and I think it probably did, that that's a political act to go clean off the grave of Charlie Parker, you know, so, but subtle, but it still is an, a social engagement. She's just not looking in the mirror or just talking to herself for the whole poem, which sometimes happens in poems, I think. So, long answer, I'm sorry. That was Doing good. Then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Natasha, yeah. Hey, thanks, good to be here. Uh-huh. But I want them to think about it. I want you to think about what that means. Yeah. Right, right. I have. I have thought about it. I thought about it with Trump. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Oh, interesting. Wow. Girl, how long have you been working on these questions? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. 
Okay. Can, um, can I, can I repeat? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to repeat those questions yeah. in case anybody. Okay, so the first um, uh, question who was, who you? claims you who you wish did not claim you? Right. And, and then the second question who does was. does not claim you that you wish did claim you? Who, yeah, who does not right. claim you who yeah, you wish that, did claim yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what was the third question? Um, About oh, privacy. how do you? Yeah, yeah. Right. Sure. Right. So that last one is a yeah question about the right. privacy and the yeah, and, and the poet. Yeah, how do yeah. you how do you know what to keep inside and and what do you choose to reveal? Well, I'll go with the last one because I actually think it's still connected to the proposition that I'm ex talking about. What. Trump really has, you know, buried in his consciousness, which is like, I, I kind of shoot for a kind of transparency is what I would say. So you can think about that as clarity, but I just thought like the Emily Dickinson movie and she had this really cutting comment to somebody like, don't confuse clarity with obviousness, you know, which people do sometimes. Like, so I don't want to be obvious, but I would like to be clear, so clear that I'm transparent. So not invisible, but see-through in ways but I also carry a thing, and I actually said this to a person who was saying to me, are you so like open? You're just so mad, you know, so open. Just a strange person somewhere. And I was like, oh, you know, beware of the person who has no secrets though. Like, you know, a person who tells you everything you should be very careful around, you know? So I'm saying to her about me, because I do like to run my mouth. I just like a good story though, you know what I mean? Like, don't tell me no good stories because I will be repeating it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so that's the, the first part of that, like answer the privacy question is that, I think, you know, it can be all out there. I can say everything, so it's why I don't like to try to sum the poems up, because I, like when you say think about it, I was like, see, I knew I should have read that poem, because I'm saying like I have, I, it is thinking, and it is thinking sort of in, in terms of the Volta. Like as soon as I come to a thought that feels weird, I'm interested in like, well, how can I turn it at an angle that makes it fit into like the geometry of my thinking? Well, beware of the person who, I don't tell you all my secrets. So that's why I would say it, but it's like, well, you think I'm, I am pretty open, but I think of openness as a kind of, and, and transparency as a kind of strength. I think of vulnerability as a kind of strength, uh, especially for people who have gotten used to being guarded, which I would say of like people of color in general, like we're very used to having our guards. And I just sort of think, um, I certainly have a certain guard, but I also know, and I mean, just like, you know, I can think of so many people like this, but even Wanda or, you know, meeting people who for whatever reason are threatened or suspicious of me. But as soon as I like start talking to them about who they are, I know all their work and I'm a fan, that usually changes that dynamic. So I just don't come at people with the kind of power dynamics that maybe people expect. And I really never have. So that's just part of trying to be like open. And uh, yeah, I mean, I try to put most stuff in the poems. I mean, I try to shape it, but I, I feel like anything can go in a poem if it goes in with the right shape. You know what I mean? So I don't, uh, but there, yeah, there's stuff. I mean, so much so that I wouldn't even go into the stuff that doesn't go into poems because, you know, if I could tell you now, I, I would put it in a poem, right? <laughs> so anyway, but the other question, I don't know, man, that's almost like a word game. Like, I'll, I'll say it another way. Like, I go back and forth about like the negative side of like, do you want to be liked or do you want to be helpful? That's what my struggle is as a person in the planet. So. Sometimes I feel like some of my actions are like, oh, you just don't want to upset anybody. And then it's like, oh, no, I actually want to help you figure some shit out, you know. And so if people are claiming me or not claiming me, I wouldn't be the person who would be like, I ain't got nothing to do with you. Because my personality is more like helpful or maybe wanting to be liked. So I get along with most people because of that. So as I said about like formalists, you know, formalists will claim me and a bunch of other people will too. And I'm like, sure, you know, sometimes because that's a kind of like, you know, somewhat diplomatic and somewhat right answer about how I sort of approach most of that stuff. You know what I mean? So, yeah, although, make sure she ain't in here. I did see, I was supposed to read with somebody who said I was a former student, they were a former student of mine. I was like, I don't know who that girl is. I hope she ain't in here right now. But yeah, so you know, I'll work that out. I'll figure out how to nicely say to her, like, who are you? <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not interested in, uh, actually I said that about the woman painting the Emmett Till too, like, well, if you think about it as a teacher, like a teacher would never say to a student, who I don't think, whoever that student was, a good teacher would never say, you can't do that. You would just say, you gotta do that a little better. You know what I mean? So that's, again, ultimately my response to the work is that it could be done better, it just ain't, it's not there yet. But 
I'm not saying you can't do it. So that's my response to everything. Like if somebody asks me for something, approaches me, I'm usually figuring out a way first to like engage them is what I'll use. On my negative days, I will say accommodate. So, you know, I go through periods where I'm like, you know, I don't know, you know, I go through the periods where I'm like, oh, I just want everybody to like me and that's really wrong. And then I go through like, I'm a helpful brother. I'm helpful for people. I help somebody today, you know, so it just depends on the day. Does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. What's that? Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. And I usually do, but I'm still looking at her like she's my uh, student. So, so like last night, I was, did I just tell the story already? Like a student was just wasting time. And then I was like, girl, you still talking? You know, and then she was like, well, I'm just going to leave. And I was like, mm. and then she didn't. And then, so that was fine. Everybody was like, ooh, wow. It, it was necessary because she was wasting everybody's time. She had been doing it for three hours. But, you know, on the plane, I was like, oh, I should send everybody an email and be like, well, you guys know I'm a total asshole when it comes to time. You should know that about me. Like, you're wasting time, and of all the stuff you could say, that's the thing that's going to make me be like, why are you still talking? Yeah. So I still apologize to the whole group, you know, like, oh, sorry for losing it. Uh, but not saying I would never do it again, but I'm also saying y'all just know, you need to, you know the thing that's going to make me mad. So I will, you know, but the, the problem that I have is like, should I apologize? Like, you know, should I, I'm a teacher, I got to apologize to these motherfuckers. And then I was like, oh, but then I thought in the strength area, but that makes me powerful though, that I can apologize to them, I'm teaching them a good lesson. So then I wrote it and was like, hey, everybody, I see y'all, you know, sorry for going off last night, you know, you was wasting my time. So anyway, that's sort of how I deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That what? Grace. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Sure. Yes. Well, you know, that's... that's oh, hold on. I may have, oh, I have to, sorry, I have to do this, like, moderator thing. Yeah, yeah. No, you're so good. Go ahead. <laughs> I, feel, I feel bad about interrupting, but uh, the man begins with a, with a claim about grace, uh, <laughs> and he said that grace still exists, but when you're writing about someone uh, like Trump, uh, is there an opportunity to be graceless, sort sure. of in an unabashed way, is the way that I'm, 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 I'm taking sure. you to mean it? Or, is, it is connected to that, because the way my head works... Like even, not to be like citing books, but like wind in a box, people would say to me, so you're doing boxes, you have four poems in every section, but then you have six poems called wind in a box. And I'm like, well, you know, a cube actually has six sides. And so I typically, anything I'm dealing with, I just turn it like that. Like I probably look at everything from about six different sides, which is a problem, you know, especially when you get ready to fight somebody. <laughs> so the short version of this story is like before <laughs> Trump got in office, my daughter, who's super like political, she's on like the uh, Black Student Union, the LGBT committee, and a bunch of other stuff that I'm like, I didn't even know y'all had clubs for that at school. So she's like a super leader. And this goes back to the Becky thing. And so her white friends, she would just be reading them. I would hear it sometimes in the car, and they'd be like crying and stuff. And they sort of started talking to the mothers, and then it got back to me, and I thought it was my job to say something. So it's like, ooh, it's so mean to those white girls, you know? So I was like, oh, I'll take her out and talk to her about it. And the gist of the conversation, this is before Trump, the gist of the conversation was just like, you know, they're figuring it out too. Like they're 15 year old white people in America trying to figure out how to talk about race. So you should read them, but remember like your being right doesn't mean you have to crush them. It just means that you can kind of gracefully deal with that unless they're to totally stupid. But these were like her friends. This is like her, cause she doesn't tolerate fools really at all. So she's got like a little, you know, two or three friends who want to hang with her cause they feel like she's righteous or whatever. But to be her friend and to be her father, too, means, because she's like, you can never read in North Carolina again. So somebody was like, we're going to give you 12 grand to read in North Carolina. I was like, you sure? <laughs> she was like, nope. And I was like, all right. I guess you won't be taking a vacation either. But anyway, so that's how she rolls. You know, she's like, that's how it is. So we had this great conversation about, like, power and still managing some grace. But, of course, that just all changed with, you know, Trump being in office because it's like, well, is grace part of what Barack Obama's problem was? So this is what I mean about the six sides. Like I can have that conversation and talk to her about like patience in the face of stupidity. And then you sort of see him on stage say like, good job. And you'd be like, well, that's grace, but mm, 
I don't know if that's right right there. You know, so I sort of, and this is an ongoing conversation. She's my kid, so we talk about it all the time. Although she cried the first time I said it to her. But, you know, but that's fine. And I was just like, those dynamics chase, change. And the best lesson that I would give to her is that, like to calibrate it according to who's in front of you as opposed to according to like the general theory of like how you treat people. So it's like, yeah, you're girl, so you sort of feel like they said something, but they're gonna be with you after you read them or how you read them. That might work, but there's certain people that you just need to dismiss and not deal with anymore. So it is sort of like, you know, uh, fashioning it according to scenario. And so for me, I don't know what the question was, but I would say even a response like that, that goes down on the record on a podcast, the lesson is not really about grace. It's just about like turning things to look at them from more than one side. Like there's that face that looks like it's flat, but it's actually a box. You know, you turn it again, it's like, oh, I didn't even see that angle on it. So that's really all I teach her without telling her how to be or who to talk to. It's more just about like, oh, you know, it is the grace, graceful thinker maybe more than anything, not forgiving your friends when they're like totally, totally off, although maybe sometimes, you know what I mean? So that would be the lesson in that. And is that a, maybe that's the kind of grace too, a kind of adaptability to your thinking and stuff. So that would be the bigger lesson, which she has. She does have that, uh, even though she's much more hardcore than I am, but she has a little bit of that. Um... Uh, a graceful sentence. Do I think about grace while I'm writing? I like a nice sentence, you know, but I don't think about it necessarily. Uh, I don't know what I think about when I'm writing. Man, I think I'm thinking about writing when I'm writing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think I want to get too self-conscious around stuff. I mean, sometimes, again, that's my favorite thing to say to everything, like sometimes, but of late, though, I, I think I'm just thinking about writing when I'm writing. You know what I mean? And then when I'm revising, maybe I'm thinking about something else. There's a craft. I'm thinking about what y'all might see when I'm revising. But when I'm writing, I'm thinking about writing. So, yeah. I think we maybe have time for one more. Okay. Um, oh, the, I saw the thumb war between I'll you answer two. it quickly, and then you can ask the... Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Quick, it's going to be a yes or no question. Well, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, you and then you up front. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. you're first. Yeah, they show up a couple of times. Right. I should have used that instead of the clip thing because it's true. <laughs> so the, the what I was trying to the work question out is about. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you only heard you the keep, response. Uh, yeah. The, the the question is about. Um, or is it really a long poem? Yeah, is, yeah. Is the is the sonnet really a long poem, and right. what's the deal with uh, Orpheus and 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 Eurydice coming up? I, I'm gonna really say no, even though maybe, but I'm gonna say no. Sometimes. But the example, right? Sometimes. Sometimes. That's just an example of me, like I'm just working on this idea that really Eurydice is a poet and not Orpheus. So she's following him out of the darkness. She's looking at his back. So she's sort of like, you know, he is the muse. And then he don't even trust her enough to like keep going. And then she goes back, like to retreat back into the darkness and meditate on what just happened while he goes out in the world and is like singing with his you know, lyre and making music and stuff. So it's like, well, who really is the poet in that dynamic? But it so happens as we get it in mythology and sort of the whole notion of like Ulysses and everybody else is that the adventurer is really the poet and the true thinker, not the person who's in the darkness. Yeah, go ahead. You know, also, right, it was the same idea. But since Orpheus is like the king poet, you know, and I, I, I like Orpheus, but so I'm really, yeah, that's a different dynamic, but you're right, it's the same principle, like who really is the artist here? I, I think that's what I'm sort of working out. So I'm saying that because, so they show up because I keep thinking about that. So rather than stopping, because I've written a poem about it, the craft of obsession says, I can just deal with it from every, whatever angle I want to deal with it. So that's why it shows up. And that happens with a bunch of stuff, including the other thing I just mentioned. So it just means that it becomes a refrain that makes it look like a series of poems, but it's really me revising an idea in the next poem. So as opposed to working on the first time it came up and making that, that perfect little box, I'll say like, that's half right, maybe I won't read that. But if I can get it right, I'll read a poem that has it. So the question that I have right now, and it's a, a long-term question is that, will I get rid of all of those screw ups or will they create some kind of like interesting thread through the poems? Because sometimes the two poems can be good and have the same basic image in them as I'm working through it. But that's all that is. That just comes up because I haven't quite worked it out yet. I believe it and I'm trying to make a case for it. So I'm kind of going through various 
situations where that could be case. Like, is, is, isn't Eurydice the poet? I think she's the poet. But you know, if I just say that, like I just said other stuff, like the comment about the black pussy, like if I just say it, it's like I need to dig down into it for you to kind of get with me. So that's part of what I do in the poems. And I actually think that's true about the Trump thing too, like that whole notion, so that it sounds like a half of an idea. And like, but you know, I'm gonna keep working through it and trying to make you see what I think is going on here about like gender dynamics and like I have another poem that's like another kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, it's another poem where people look at me weird when I read it, and it's like, well, I think I'm like a lover, but you know, I've like never had sex with a man, but I think anybody that's a lover would feel a little bit of shame about that, you know, or feel a little bit like, man, you know, it seems like I should, but I just, I just haven't, you know what I mean? So like, to me, that's a poem, but can I get that right in 14 lines? You know, I might have you to like, did, you did. There's cycle a poem, it through. I, uh, b at Pegasus? Right, yeah, that's Where, like the first poem in my Orpheus first book. Shows up, sure. And it's you thinking about that's right. Being, being dancing in a gay club, right? And yeah, being yeah. a little bit like, oh, I get right. why you would dance. But in the a fact gay that club. I'm still working on it is the craft of obsession. Yeah. Like saying it is gender dynamics and sort of trying to put an idea in the world, partly for like hetero dudes too. You know, like saying, you know, it's okay, we can sort of talk about this. You know, and figuring out how to make that part of it. Like, is that my subject or is it just an obsession? Or is it just something I think about walking through the world all the time, you know? Like, there's something there. Like, there hasn't been quite enough on the record about this interesting dynamic of like desire for, or is it a black man's desire, a male desire, basic human desire, and like the blurry lines around those things. So I feel like I can work that out, but again, is that like, you know, when I was working, I was like, let me make sure it's clear. I don't want no dudes to be coming up to me saying, I can help you out, you know? And so I'm like, how do I work this out to say, like, I would be flattered. I wouldn't be turned off by that, but that's sort of not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about like a real kind of like black and white desire. I'm talking about something that needs poetry in order to articulate fully all of the sides of that kind of thing. So that's true for everything, politics, gender, all of it is something where I just, I would prefer to have more than one side to it. And that's usually what I'm working out. So was that, I said yes or no, that was not a yes or no answer, so I don't know if that's the last one. Does, you, yeah. <laughs> does this one, does, is your question a yes or no question? Yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there a <laughs> is there a connection between rhyme, repetition, and the volta, which is a fancy way of, of saying turn? I will be thinking about that tonight. So the short answer would be like, I don't think so. I mean, I like a visual. I mean, I always say to my students, like, I, it ain't in an essay until I write it. So I have a notion of like visual rhymes and poems. So even like the orange poem, like I'm doing kind of visual rhymes there, like the images are rhyming around color, even if it's not an explicit rhyme. So that's crazy stuff that's just, you know, me at home working stuff out like that. But otherwise, I don't think of it as any kind of really conscious thing where I could give you a smart answer beyond I don't think so. Hold on, I do have a I do have a, a question that I'm burning to ask for some reason. All right. Okay. Speaking of obsession, uh -huh. speaking of what you keep private, what you keep public, do you have a karaoke song that you go why are you to asking me that? every why time? Are you asking me that? I know do, why you're asking do, me this. <laughs> Is there one where you're like, every time I just have to do it? I don't really do karaoke though. Oh, I don't really? really sing in public or dance in public. That's the truth. So you would we'll be like, the time you saw me singing, what would that would be? And you know what the answer to that is. Yeah. But generally, no, I don't uh, sing or dance in public. Hence, you know, working out poems. Like, I don't know how to do that. So, I mean, I do it at home. I dance all the time. Yeah. I was getting off yesterday, listening to some young thug. <laughs> I was. I was like, it's good. And I thought, maybe I should videotape myself so I can prove to my kids that I dance, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but no, I don't generally do either of those things. Huh. Uh, except for in certain mind states is what I'll say. But I, there's not enough booze in the world to get me drunk enough really to dance. So, but uh, there's other stuff that can make me dance. Yeah, I know it, I know it. The reason he said that is because right when it was legalized, I was in a, I was doing karaoke. So. 
And I think everybody thought I must be a great karaoke person, which I, that's the last time I did it, you know. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So. No, it was after, it was the day that George Zimmerman right. came that's right. out. Right, that's right, that's right. And he was, he was, he was, he was innocent, he was found innocent, mm -hmm. he was acquitted. Crazy. And then you did Change Is Gonna Come. Right. And it was just like, ugh. And mm -hmm. it sounded like you had done it every single day of your life. No, man. That's the magic of the stuff, you know. <laughs> I just remember I was on my knees and like, you know, I remember it too. Uh, and I was like, man, I wish I could do that again. But you know, it was just the moment, I think. So, but generally, no. I mean, I used to sing in chorus in high school, but yeah. I'm way too self-conscious. I had a poem that had singing in it because again, if you just think about really basic challenges, I have a few poems where I'm like, I'm gonna sing this, I'm gonna sing this. And then I get up and I'm like, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that. Last time I sang was in like Shanghai, you know, where nobody would ever see it on stage. Like, they don't even know what I'm saying. I can just sing this thing. But generally, I imagine myself being challenged that way, to be totally like doing that. But then I start getting too self-conscious. So. Well, thanks for coming out. I don't want to keep you. Thank you all. This is great. This is great.